So we're good. this is the first part of a three-part series. We're doing what was today, and I'm going to cover all the history from creation to Christ. My wife says I'm crazy, and that might be, but I think I can do this. Um, the last time I did this was a high school camp, and I think it took me two hours, but I'm condensed it down, um, and then so I think we're good. And then next week, I'm going to do what is, uh, this, which is the church age from Christ, from, from Christ to about now. I, I've got till 9-11 figured out. I don't know if I'm going to go past that yet, but I might. Um, and then the following week, what is to come from the end times, which is now to no time, which is heaven, because there's no time in heaven. So basically, it's going to be the book of Revelation, the third week. Um, and that's about it, because I don't know what's going to happen between now and the book of Revelation, because uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm not that kind of prophet. Uh, so, so we're just going to do the book of Revelation, the third one. Um, and if you're curious, I like to take things literally. If the Bible says it, I like to believe that's what happens. Um, so, so if you're wondering what, what I think about Revelation, that should sum it up for you. Okay, so in stu- when studying history, um, w- one of the reasons we study history is because it's what God has done. So I'm going to read Romans 15.4. It's written up here. You can open up your Bibles to Romans 15.4 if you'd like. Uh, it says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. We're supposed to study history. That we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have peace. The point of studying history, as boring as it may seem for you, and I'm not going to do the dates tonight because that always throws people off. I'll, do, I'll, I'll give you like markers, but that's about it. Um, but, but the reason we study is so that we can have patience and comfort, remembering that God is good. Some people think of history as what happened. But if we're, if we're looking from a Christian perspective, we can see history as what God has done. You can see in your own personal history, your own personal lives, what God has done in your life. Um, but here we're going to follow uh, God's perspective. Uh, we're going to follow the Jews through, through the world. Um, all the way up into Christ's resurrection. And then next week, we'll, we'll follow the church age after the resurrection. Um, and in history, we always look at cause and effect. This happened so that this could happen. Um, because one thing leads to another. We couldn't have World War II without having World War I first, not just because of the naming thing, is, but, but we'll get to that next week. Um, I've got enough stuff to talk about this week. This, they're not talking about uh, what happens next. So the, the most modern historians break time up into three ages, the ancient age, the modern age, and, or the middle age and the modern age. Um, and that's according to most Western historians. That's how it's broken up. The ancient age is anything that happened before AD 500, uh, middle ages from AD 500 to October 31st, 1517, and modern age is anything after October 31st, 1517. Um, That's just how it's broken up. You're wondering, why is it broken up that way? Because there was a huge shift in how uh, people thought and what people did. Um, From the ancient age to the middle age in AD 500, that was the fall of Rome. So going from the big Roman Empire uh, into uh, serfdom and and medieval Europe. Um, And then from the middle age to the modern age, it's a very specific date, October 31st, 1517. Anyone know what happened? 95 Thesis on the door, that's exactly right. Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis door. It was the beginning of Protestantism. Um, and we've seen that Protestantism has dominated the world ever since. And God has moved mightily through that. And we're going to take a look at that next time. This time we're going to stay in the ancient age. So here's the timeline I made for you. It's a, it's a line and it represents time. That's why it's called a timeline. Um, we won't have exact dates on our timeline because that throws a lot of people off. So we're just going to do approximations. I'll just do arrows pointing to somewhere on the timeline. Um, but the whole idea is so that when we, read the, when we read the Bible, you kind of know where in time it was. So creation was about 4,000 B.C. Um, so I, I, Pastor Daniel told me about this earlier. He said that he was listening to Chuck Smith talk about this. And he says that he was 60 years old when he was giving some message. And he noticed that uh, he was alive for 1% of all of time. So if you're 60 years old, you made the 1%. You can make it to 90, you got 1.5%. <laughs> all right, so there's creation. Um, around 2500 BC, the flood happened. I don't have an exact date on that, but we're going to say about 2500. Between 6,000 and 2500, we don't have a whole lot of information, uh, a lot of genealogies, but not a whole lot of information about what stuff happened. So We're leaving most of that blank. Um, Around 2000 BC, Abraham walked the earth. 
So now what I'm doing is I'm just going to, every 500 years, I'm going to tell you what's happening so that you can just get markers in your mind. Um, and, and this would be good stuff to memorize. Uh, 2000 BC is Abraham. Okay, he's, he's, he's alive then. Um, and then around 1500, that's when Moses was growing up in Pharaoh's house. So, you know, 2000 BC, Abraham, 1500, Moses, uh, 1000 BC, David walked the earth. So, so that's, so it's just 2000 Abraham, 1500 Moses, 1000 David, and then 500 BC, the Jews returned to Jerusalem. So, you know, going back in, in the BC era before Christ, every 500 years, uh, this, this will help you place things in, in history. Uh, Jerusalem is 500 BC, David's 1000. Moses is 1,500, Abraham's 2,000, floods 2,500, and creation's back there at like 6,000 B.C. And of course, you know Jesus Christ died on the cross about A.D. 33. Um, and so we, we, that, that's where we're going to stop today is when Jesus died on the cross, and we're going to start with the resurrection next week. Um, and there's a reason for that, and I'll get to it when I get there. Um, so in this... In this uh, study tonight. Everything takes place entirely in the ancient age. We, we're going to talk about approximately 4,000 years, which is the longest span I will cover. Um, all of the Old Testament's in here, and I got 32 things to talk about. But I had short announcements, so we're okay. You guys ready? Deep breath. All right, let's talk about creation. So creation, like I said, is at 6,000 BC. It's where God created the earth he created it in six days and on the seventh day. I didn't do that yet. Go back. <laughs> Don't get ahead of me. All right. Um, so on, on the seventh day, he rested. Um, of course, here we have to contend with the theory of evolution. It's wrong. Um, I could tell you why it's wrong, but that's going to be a whole other topic. I don't have enough time to do that. And if you believe that evolution is right, um, you can talk to me about it afterwards. Um, and, and, and I'd love to talk to you about it, but... I'm just going to say it's wrong right now, and, and I'll talk to you about it later. Um, and if you don't believe me, that's okay. You can still be a Christian. You can believe in evolution and be a Christian. All you do is believe in Jesus Christ, and then you believe that Jesus Christ wrote the word, read the, uh, wrote the word through his Holy Spirit, and then you read you know, the first chapter of Genesis, and you're like, okay, God made it. Um, and, so, and that's really why I don't believe in evolution. Uh, that, that's the short version. And, but I love reading about creation uh, and science and, and why evolution couldn't be true. I think it's fascinating. So I do know more stuff, and I'd like to talk to you about it if you're curious. Uh, but I'm just jumping to the end. That's what I believe, and that's why I believe it. Some Christians believe that creation um, could have happened over many, many years. They take that verse in Peter where it says, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. A thousand years is like a day. Um, so maybe, you know, a day isn't really a day. A day is more than a day. Maybe each day is a millennium. Maybe each day is an era or, or something. And, and I think God says, I did it in six days, so he did it in six days. Um, and, and honestly, that's, that's the reason for it. I have faith in that. And it's easier to have faith in something that God did because he wrote the book uh, than, than to have faith in something that we're trying to figure out. And if you mix evolution and creation, you're not going to make any sense to the evolutionists because they want to say there is no God. You're not going to make any sense to Christians who believe the sixth day because they're just like, that's what the Bible says. And it's kind of like trying to have your foot in the world and in Christ at the same time. It just doesn't work. You don't have a place to stand. Um, so, so that's what it is. You, got, you, guys know that, you guys know what happens. On the first day, he separates uh, light and darkness. On the second day, he did it again. On the second day, he separates waters above from the waters below. Third day, he makes land appear and along with vegetation. Fourth day is the sun and the moon and the stars. Fifth day is the birds and the fish. Um, and I think God creates... A, God thinks everything in the water is a fish. I don't think he separates whales and dolphins into a different class. It's like, hey, it swims. I'm calling it a fish. Um, sixth day, the land animals uh, and man. And the seventh day, God rested. And how cool is that? He does all this work on, on man's first day of existence. God takes a break. You know, and he rests and he spends time with him. And, and you can see that God's heart throughout all of, all of this, all of history, God's heart is for you and me. His heart is for us. His heart is for his people. He chose the Jews to be his light in the world because he wanted to reach the world. The reason Jesus was so upset when he went into the temple and kicked everybody out of the temple was because they were selling and buying stuff in the court of the Gentiles, basically saying, hey, people who weren't Jewish can't come worship God 
because we took all that space up for our marketplace. They were hindering people from following God, people who desired to follow God, people who wanted to follow God. They were saying, you can't do it. And that's why Jesus was upset. All right, Garden of Eden takes place right after creation. God makes a garden for them to, to, to stay. He made the whole earth wonderful, but he makes a specific garden for Adam and Eve. God's got a specific plan for you. If, you got, if you're not married and you think, man, I'd like to be married someday, um, then, then you might think, well, I could marry anybody, I, this one or that one or that one. But God's got a specific person that he's, he's for you. Yeah, it could work with anybody, but this is his plan. This is the person that he has lined you up with, and, and you don't know who he is, his, or you don't know who she is yet. And you're hoping to know. You want to know. But it's God's timing. And, and, and just a note for you, I could not get married because God wouldn't let me, until I stopped wanting a wife for me. Does that make sense? Until I really wanted to be a husband instead of wanting a wife, I wasn't ready to get married. Because being married is not about yourself. Um, And and, and we'll talk about that more at the Valentine's Day dinner, so come to that. Um, so, So right now, we're in the Garden of Eden. It looks nice. Everything's perfect. Um... And, and everybody's happy, although they're all vegetarians, um, and they don't have any clothes. So I don't know how happy I'd be there, but I'm sure I would be, because God would tell me to be happy, and I think I'd, I'd obey. Um, but I would sure miss the bacon. Okay, so next we have the fall, right? We have the time when Eve was deceived and Adam sinned. So whose fault was it? Yes, both of their faults. You can point fingers at each other and yourself. Uh, Eve should have known better. Adam, should have, Adam definitely knew better for sure, uh, and he didn't do it. So, so let's, let, let's not play the blame game, and let's say we, they, they did it. We're capable of it ourselves. Personally, I'd like to think that they didn't fall like on day eight, you know, that they had some time of wonderful fellowship with the Lord before they sinned. Um, but some people are like, I think they sinned on day eight because I would have done it on day eight, you know? <laughs> Maybe like the evening on day seven. Um, and so, but it's just like, who knows? I don't know. Bible doesn't say. We know it was within the first 130 years because the, um, they didn't have kids till, till after that. Uh, but they fell. And when they fell, they threw this entire world off of God's plan. God had a backup plan because God always knows what's going to happen. He's like, this is what I would like you to do. And then when you don't do that, it's like, okay, I knew you were going to mess up. Here's what we're going to do now. And he always does that. Um, just like parents, we ask our kids to do things that, that they think they can't do. And sometimes we know, well, they can't do it, but I'm going to ask him to do it anyway because I want him to try to do it. And when he messes up and when he realizes he can't do it, then I will help him and show him how to do it so he can do it next time. But we want our kids to fail so that they can learn to get back up again. If your kids don't fail, they become spoiled brats. And nobody likes spoiled brats. Yeah. <laughs> then we have Cain and Abel. Um, this, is, this is Adam and Eve's uh, sons, uh, probably most likely first sons. There's no evidence in the Bible that they had any children before Cain and Abel. They were great sons for a while. They grew up. One of them, ten, uh, Cain, tended the, 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 the uh, grass, sorry, the fields, and, the ve- and, he, and he grew vegetables. Abel tended the sheep. They came to offer their sacrifices to God. Abel did what he was supposed to do, Cain didn't. He thought, what I have is good enough. But God, re- God, God, God required something more. It doesn't say what he required in that scripture, but it's, it, we, can, we can guess that he required a blood sacrifice because we know from later on that, that, that a blood sacrifice is required to cover our sins. Vegetables aren't going to cut it. Um, and, so, and so Abel did what he was supposed to do. Cain didn't. And, and, and because of his jealousy, Cain struck and killed Abel. It was the first murder. It was horrible. And then Cain gets banished, and Adam and Eve lose both of their sons in the same day. Um, so it's, it's horrible for everyone, but it's sin, and it happened, uh, and it happened right away. Well, within the first hundred-something years before Seth was around. Um, and then we, fa- and we fast forward uh, 1,500 years or whatever that is uh, to the flood. 
Um, so, so, so both, uh, both Cain's descendants and Seth's descendants filled and multiplied the earth, and they were wicked. They were, they were all wicked. Some people argue about the Nephilim and the giants coming into the land. Um, I don't see a point to arguing about that because the flood wiped them all out anyway. Whether or not they were here, I don't really care. Uh, but the point is they were wicked, even if they were here. And, and they, 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 they didn't follow the Lord. And the Lord says, I'm going to start over. I will choose the one guy who's preaching my name, Noah, and he will be, um, he will be my guy. And so, so he, he wiped everybody out in the flood and, and, brought, um, all, uh, and brought Noah and the animals through it on this ark that he had Noah built. You guys know this story. We've got pictures of it in the Sunday school room. Um, we left out the painting of the guys dying and drowning in the water uh, because we didn't think that was appropriate for the kids. But you know that's what was going on. Um, and and, and it's, it, it shows that, that God, he saves, but he also judges. And, and if we think God just saves and he's loving and kind, he can never do anything uh, that that would be be harmful to anybody. We don't give God. We don't do God justice. He 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 is he is a, a fear a, a God to be feared. He is a terrible God in a sense that that we should we should have terror uh, when we think of Him in our sin. Yeah, He's loving, and He cares for us. And the reason we know that is because we're not dead right now. The fact that he's kept us alive because of all the stuff that I've done to him, I deserve that death on the cross that he died for. He is a God who judges as much as he is a God who loves. And the great thing is he lets you decide what side you're going to land on. Are you going to land on his his loving side or are you going to land on his judgment side? It's your choice he's giving. And, And it's really the only choice you have. So Noah, there he is. Um, some people like think about his, his, his lineage, like his dad Lamech died a year before the flood. Methuselah died the year of the flood, if you do the math right. And, um, and, and so you wonder, did, did God wait till Methuselah died to bring the flood maybe? Or did Methu- was Methuselah just as wicked as everybody else and died in the flood? And if that's the case, then even you know, Noah's grandfather wasn't righteous enough to be saved. Just Noah and his wife and their three sons and their wives. And it was their job to repopulate the earth. They do so uh, really quickly, by the way. Noah is still alive during the Tower of Babel. He gets to witness all of his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren sin against the Lord by building a huge tower. And I wonder as he's there saying, no, don't do that. That's that's the stupidest idea ever. Um, You should just follow God's instructions and love him and things will be well with you if he was reminded of his preaching before the flood, um, because that's probably what he preached before the flood, and the people of wickedness did the wicked stuff. And this time, God doesn't, um, doesn't kill them with the flood. He disperses them. He confuses their language and disperses them throughout the whole world. Um, and then you have all the nations coming out of this, uh, from the Chinese to the Japanese to the Native Americans uh, to, to the Africans. All this comes out of this, this Tower of Babel split. Uh, and if you go back in the, sec- in, in the um, folklore histories of these ancient tribes, who, especially those who have been separated from the rest of the world because their, their histories have been preserved, uh, when, we invade, when, when, one per- when one people invade another people, uh, one thing they do is erase the local history um, because they don't want the, the people to have a separate identity uh, than, than, the, than the invaders um, because then they will rise up and rebel with that identity. So, so they want to kind of assimilate them into the crowd. Uh, Assyria does that. Babylon tries to do that with the, with the Jews, but it doesn't work. Um, and so on and so forth. But if you, if you look at the, if you find some ancient, history, ancient cultures and look at their history, you're going to see a flood. Um, you're gonna, some of them you even see a, a, long, a, a long walk to get to where they are, uh, the, dis, the, the dispersal. And there's a great book in the bookstore called Eternity in, the, Eternity in Their Hearts by Don Richardson. Um, and the first chapter or so, he explains like seven or eight or nine uh, different, different um, local tribes, or different tribes with their local folklores that, that describe this stuff. And it is amazing. I, just reading that caused me to praise the Lord. So anyway, we got the Tower of Babel. That's about 2100 BC. I'm, not giving you, I'm just giving you about date so you can see where it fits into history. 
And then, um, and then it probably looked like this, but we don't really know. And they say it reaches up to heavens, um, basically just meant it's really tall. No one's actually going to walk up this building and get to heaven and hang out with God. Um, but it's just going to be, they're, they're making a name for themselves so that they'll be able to see it from afar off because they don't want to be dispersed. And it's really strange that if you read the story, they built that so that they wouldn't be dispersed by God, and then they were. Um, so it's like, how did they know that that was the plan um, for, for, for their wrongdoing? I don't know. Um, so then, so then um, after this dispersal, Abra Abraham is called out of his father's house. They're living in Ur, which is the modern-day Iraq. Um, and his dad takes him and his brother to a place called Haran, which is north of Israel. Um, and then he, and Abraham gets called out again. When Abram's called out, Noah is still alive at this point. When Abraham's called out, it's not that far, uh, that, that far away. I mean, he, Noah doesn't outlive Abraham, but he's still alive when Abraham's called out of, of Ur. And I think that's amazing. Um, and just can you imagine, like, what if Abraham met him? What if Noah told Abraham the story about the flood? and creation, which he heard from generations gone by. You know, and if, if you count, because these guys had extremely long lives, it's not that far to Moses who wrote it all down. I mean, you can get from Noah to Abraham in, in, in one sitting, and you can go from Abraham um, to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, uh, Jacob to Joseph, and then, and then by the time they get to Egypt, it's only four generations before Moses is there. So that's like eight people who have to get the story right. Uh, in order to get the story all the way to Moses, who wrote it down, which is amazing. Um, but, but even if they didn't, we know Moses had the Holy Spirit uh, to, to inspire him, so we know he's right. So Abraham walks the earth. He, he's called out by God to start a new nation. For, for a time, God's been silent. This was a time of silence we don't talk about much, from uh, 2100 uh, to about 2000, so you know, maybe 100 years from when he's dispersed, Everyone's starting their own stuff. And then now Abraham gets called and says, hey, I want to make you a light. I want you to shine. You are the one. And through your descendants, people are going to know who created them. I mean, what an amazing calling on your life. And he's old by this time. He's 75 years old when he moves out of his dad's house. You know, that he's been there a while. And, and, and now we're going to start your career. Okay, so he moves out of his dad's house, uh, starts wandering around um, with his wife and his nephew, um, and, and, and you guys know the story of Abraham. Uh, God promises them a son. He delivers it uh, with Isaac. Um, Abraham tried to cheat with Ishmael because he listened to his wife, um, and you should always listen to your wife, but you shouldn't always do what they say. Pray to, pray to God and ask God what the right thing is to do, but your wife is your best counselor. It's, your wife's always your best counselor. Um, and you should always listen to her, um, but know that your wife is human. She makes just as many mistakes as you do. She just smells better. And so, um, and so Isaac grows up. Isaac doesn't do a whole lot in the Bible. He just kind of passes the torch uh, from Abram to, to Jacob, um, and Jacob becomes Israel. Uh, Jacob is, is a thief and a liar at the beginning of his life, and near the end of his life, He's, he's too old to be those things. So he just kind of goes, he goes to Egypt um, and Pharaoh meets him. You know, Pharaoh says, wow, you're old. How old are you? You know, he's like, I'm 130 and, and, and my life has been full of trouble. Trouble that he's caused himself, by the way. Um, but God still uses him and the Jews call him a father of the faith. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These are the guys that they look up to. And if you read their stories, it's full of mistakes and sin. It's actually one of the proofs that, that the Old Testament is, is, is true. Because if you were making this stuff up, you'd make yourself look better. <laughs> but it's true. If you were going to make up your own history, you'd make yourself look like a hero. But they're always failing, and God's always coming to the rescue. So Jacob's got 12 sons uh, and a daughter, and, and one of his sons is named jo Joseph. And Joseph um, is his favorite. It's not, he, Jacob plays favorites. His dad played favorites. It's never a good idea to play favorites. Uh, so his other brothers get jealous, throw him in the well, sell him to Egypt. 
Um, and, and, and there, God, he listens to the Lord, and he rises from the depths of a jail cell to second the command only the Pharaoh. Um, and this Pharaoh, by the way, as if you look at my Moses, if you've been to my Moses study, he probably was a Hyksos guy, and I think we named him. Um, and then, uh, and then the, and then there's there's another, you know, hundreds of years uh, while they're in Egypt, they become slaves because a new Pharaoh rises up who doesn't know Joseph. Um, but it's more likely that this guy, the guy who rises up, is an Egyptian, is Thutmos. And, he's, and he wants to squash anybody who's not truly an Egyptian. I mean, they were racist back then because um, everybody was. Um, so, so he's like everybody who's not really an Egyptian by blood, out of office. There's a bunch of Hebrews here. We got to do something with them. Let's make them slaves. Um, and it's not the only time that happens. When, when uh, the Israelites come into the promised land later on under Joshua and these guys trick them and say, hey, pr promise us you won't kill us. And he says, oh, yeah, we promise. Oh, what? We were supposed to kill you. Um, they make him slaves. Um, you know, maybe because they're like, hey, we got made slaves. Maybe we'll make these guys slaves. Um, but they couldn't kill him, and so that's what they did. Um, and then, of course, Moses comes by and rescues them. Uh, well, actually, God rescues them. But the people of Israel had a hard time differentiating between God and Moses. Moses was basically an idol in a lot of their lives. And, and you'll see that as you read through the Torah, um, that they come to Moses and complain. They come to Moses and do this, come to Moses and do this, and, and, and stuff like that. And, and he's like, the weight of being God falls on his shoulders, which I think is why he struck the rock instead of spoke to it. When God says, speak to the rock, he struck the rock because he was angry at them like he feels God should be angry at them. Um, and that was his big sin. He misrepresented the Lord. But at the beginning, he did, at the beginning, when he was 80 years old. So if you're an old guy, career change at 80 for Moses. You know, he career changed at 40. He was, he, he was growing up in the palace. He, he may have written Genesis while he was in the, while he was in the king's house. Who knows? Uh, but but uh, he, he career changed at 40, career changed at 80. And now he's going to be a shepherd of people instead of a shepherd of sheep. And he leads the guys out of Egypt uh, after the 10 plagues with the permission of the Pharaoh, uh, through the Red Sea. Oh, here are the ten plagues. I forgot I did this. In case you're curious what the ten plagues were, they're blood, frogs, lice, flies, livestock, boils, hail and fire, locusts, darkness, and then death of the firstborn. Uh, the first nine uh, plagues are, are directly against Egyptian gods. Like they worship the sun, no sun, darkness. They worshiped the frogs. I don't know why you worship a frog god, but they did because, you know, the river was right there. It's like, okay, you like frogs? Here's a bunch of frogs. Uh, with the lice and flies, uh, the, 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 their gods that they worship were supposed to keep the lice and flies away. So by bringing the lice and flies, God was showing that their gods had no power. And the tenth one, death of the firstborn, that was a plague against Pharaoh. It was his job to protect the people. And this was God showing Pharaoh that he was powerless. If you remember all other nine plagues, Pharaoh told Moses, make it stop. And then Moses made it stop. Well, he, he prayed to God and God made it stop. So Pharaoh felt like he had some control. He could call when it was done. The last one, he could not make that call. It was, it was over. So then they cross in the Red Sea. Um, and the Red Sea is amazing. It shows God's deliverance and through tribulation. When you feel like you're up against the wall, you're like, there's no possible way that I can get out of this. Look to the Lord. There's a way. They walked through water. Some of you drove through fire. God provided. He always provides and he protects. And we trust him in this. So then they, they go to, this. skip the pick? Oh, yeah, that one's weird. Uh, so there we go. Um, so after that, we get the Ten Commandments. Uh, the Ten Commandments are, are, are like the basic foundation of the law that God's setting up with the Israelites. And, and, and unlike the other laws, God spoke these words directly to all two million plus people. 
He gathered them to the mountain. He told Moses, stay away from the mountain, but be near it. Whoever touches it shall die. The mountain was inflamed, engulfed in flame and fire. And the voice of God spoke these words to everybody. They all heard them. They all knew exactly what God wanted. And their response to their shame and to mine for being a human with them was, Moses, we don't want to hear God. Go up the mountain, you find out what God wants, and then you tell us what God wants us to do, and then we'll do it. We don't want to hear from God directly. How horrible is that? How sad is that? If I was Moses, I, I would agree with God, say, strike him down. Let's start over. These guys aren't worth it. But no, Moses pleaded for God, plead, pleaded for them to God, saying, hey, they're your people, and if you struck them down, everybody saw you deliver them out of Egypt. If you kill them now, then they're going to say, you just brought them out here to die, and then they won't want to follow you. And then while he was up there, getting the tablets where it was written on by God's finger, he came down and they were dancing around the golden calf. And he goes up to his brother Aaron, who made the calf, by the way, and he says, what's going on? And he gives him the worst excuse ever. Well, you were up there for a really long time. It was 40 days. And we didn't know if you were dead or not, so uh, we just threw our gold in the fire and this cow popped out. And we decided to take all our clothes off and dance around it because that was the right thing to do, right? Uh, so Moses grinds it up, makes the people drink it, draws a line in the sand and says, whoever is with God, stand with me. And then if you're wondering where the line in the sand came, that's where it came from. Um, and so all the Levites came, came to him. He says, put your swords on. We're going to avenge God's name tonight. Um, and, and there was a great slaughter within the camp of Israel. And that, that's what earned the Levites their position serving before the Lord. It's because they stood with Moses on that day. And there's going to, become a, there's going to come a time in your life where there's going to be a line drawn in the sand, and you're going to know explicitly, I need to stand up for the Lord here. This is something I need to do. You won't be forced to do it, but you're going to feel that drive. And you're going to need to stand up for the Lord then. If you don't do it, you're going to regret it every day after that. It's worth it, standing up for the Lord. Now, I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know when it's going to be. But every day in a Christian's life, or every, every Christian's life, I believe there's going to be a day when you're going to have to stand up for the Lord, and you're not going to feel like it. It's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to be scared. But you know what God is telling you to do. And you need to be obedient. If you don't, God will still love you. You still get to go to heaven, but you are going to miss out on the best ministry of your life. God's got a plan, and when you fail, he's got a backup plan. But this plan's always the better one. Learn from their mistakes. All right, so then they spend 40 years in the wilderness because they don't obey the Lord and go into the promised land. Um, so now we're about 1350 or something like that BC as we're working our way up. Moses eventually dies. Joshua takes over um, and, and he leads them into the promised land. He gets to lead them in because uh, he obeyed the Lord. When he was a spy going into the land, he came back and said, yeah, let's do it. Let's invade. Uh, even when the people said no. And so Joshua and Caleb, the only two were allowed to go in. They get to, they get to be a part of it. In case you're curious, Joshua is from the tribe of Ephraim, um, and, uh, and Caleb is from the tribe of Judah. When the kingdom splits later into, into Judah and Israel, Jeroboam, the guy who gets to be king of Israel, is, is from the tribe of Ephraim, and, and uh, Rehoboam, who's, who's uh, Judah's king, is from the tribe of Judah. I think, I think Jeroboam gets it, kind of because his great-great-great-great-grandfather, or his, his relative Joshua, was so faithful to the Lord. I think that's why it fell upon him. The honor fell upon him. And then he squashed it. He squandered it. He did the evil thing. There's a reason we don't call our kids Jeroboam. Maybe there's two reasons. Who knows? Um, after Joshua, there's like 400 years of, from, of the period of the judges. Um, and so far, you're like, okay, this makes sense because we're just going through the Bible and this is all, all happens in order because this part happens in order. Uh, the judges... Uh, Start with like Ehud, I think. I forgot which the first one is. Or, or that guy with the, oh, Othaniel or whatever. I can't say, I can never say it. Um, and the last judge is Samuel. 
uh, because after Samuel uh, is a king, Samuel actually gets to anoint two kings. He gets to anoint King Saul, the first king of Israel, um, who, who looked good. He was exactly what the people asked for, but he was an earthly man. He, he was not heavenly minded. He always, wanted, he always wanted to look good. He always wanted people to like him. Whether or not he was right, he wanted to look like he was right. And, and, and if you don't know what that, what, what that means, it's kind of like when a guy says, I'm always right, even when I'm wrong, I, I, I just push harder because so, I, I can't give up and I can't show that I was wrong. That, that, that was Saul. Um, and so, so he's, he's not going to admit he was wrong. He's going to do whatever he can to cover up his wrongness so it looks like he's okay. And then scandal versus uh, follow scandal. And then there's David, a man after God's own heart. Samuel appoints him as, as a kid. Saul tries to kill him because he doesn't want David taking over the throne, but God's giving David the throne. So Saul eventually dies. David becomes king, and he does everything right. No, he doesn't. Actually, honestly, if I read through the scriptures, I haven't really counted, but I think we read more of David's sins than, than anybody else's. Yet he was called a, God, a man after God's own heart. God loved David not because of his sin, but because after he sinned, he always repented. He always came back. And if you ask David about his sin, he's like, yeah, I did that. He wasn't trying to hide his sin. Every sin that God, that, that, that God busted him on became a trophy that he could put on his wall. It's like, this is how good God is. Because I did this horrible thing. And God redeemed me from it. And with your sins, sometimes we try to hide them. Sometimes we brag about them of how bad of a person I was before I came to Christ. And, and the emphasis is wrong. If you talk about your past sins and how horrible they were, it shouldn't be like how cool I was and then I became the Christ and became a boring Christian like everybody else. It should be like, and, and God saved me from that. So your sin seems like a much smaller thing. God definitely will save you from that. If he saved me from this, he'll save you from that. And your sin even is a testimony of Jesus Christ in your life. Just make sure it's past sin. Don't keep doing the stuff. If you want to know what God wants you to do, because like, what's God's will in my life? First one is just stop sinning. Stop doing the bad stuff. You know what it is. Don't do it anymore. And if you feel like you can't, that you're stuck, then you need to pray and ask Jesus to help you out. Show you how you can do it because we read through the scriptures that we have the power over sin. We have his power over sin. And, and there's no way that God's not strong enough to deliver you. And if you need help, then get help from people you love. Don't just try and hide it. God is that good. And sometimes he wants to use somebody else around you to help you deliver you from your sin because it'll help them become a stronger Christian. Maybe it's not about you. Give you a hint, it's not about you. <laughs> After David was king for 40 years, Solomon, uh, his son, becomes king. And this is a time of, uh, of great um, jubilation in Israel. Everybody's happy, at the beginning anyway. Um, Solomon's a great king. He builds the temple. God's presence comes in a mist, in a dark cloud, and so thick that people can't do their jobs in the temple because he just fills the place with his presence and everybody worships. And it's an amazing day. Absolutely amazing. They say uh, that the, the um, what's that word? The legend is that whenever they offered sacrifices in the temple, which they did continually, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that the smoke would rise straight up to heaven. It doesn't matter what the wind was doing. The smoke would go straight up. It would not go to the left, not get blown by the wind. It would just go straight up. And I hope that's true. That would be really cool. It's not in scripture, so I'm not like placing stuff on it. But if it's true, it's a great picture of, of how we are supposed to be in the Lord. This world is a tumultuous world. I mean, we had a tornado forming today south of, uh, south of here. You know, it's just like, it's crazy. Fire, flood the next week, now tornadoes. I guess next week is earthquakes, right? <laughs> you know, we're collecting disasters now. Um, and so... And so, uh, so, so no matter what this world is doing, we can stand straight up 
Our eyes can be on the Lord. And we cannot be moved. And how cool is that to not be moved in times of trouble? And in fact, if you look at Ephesians where it talks about the armor of God, the entire armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the feet, the sandals of peace, uh, what's left? The shield of, of faith and the sword of the spirit. All of that is so that you can stand. Because it tells you first to stand. Put on the armor of God and stand. We don't need to advance because the war is already over. We just need to not run away. That's it. If you think of David and Goliath, what did all of Israel do during that battle? They stood. David went out to fight Goliath. Our God is our David. Jesus Christ is our David. He will go out. He will fight the Goliaths in our lives. We just don't back down. We get to watch his victory. We get to enjoy his victory. We get to to, to claim his victory. We just don't back down. We need to stand. Solomon didn't stand. He got bored. He chased after everything else. If you think there's something out there better than God, Solomon tried it, and he realized if you read Ecclesiastes at the end, it's all about God. Nothing else satisfies. Unfortunately, after Solomon, the kingdom split into two. Solomon really taxed the people heavily because he liked to party a lot. And so when his son Rehoboam came to be king after Solomon died, the people came to him and said, hey, we want to have an easier life. Can you reduce the taxes on us a bit? He's like, um, I don't know. Let me think about it. I'll get back to you. Come back in three days. You know, it's like he couldn't text them with his decision. So he said, just come back in three days. I'll tell you then. So he goes and talks to people. The old guys who served under his dad says, yeah, lower the taxes. They'll love you. They'll serve you forever. The young guys who grew up with him in the palace and all the parties are like, no way. Don't show them. That, that's, that, that say that, says that you're weak. So you should, you know, increase the taxes. Make it harder on the people because they're your people. They're, they live to serve you, right? Nope. He went, and, he, he went and told them that, and they're like, we're out of here. Ten of the 12 tribes left to follow Jeroboam, um, who, of course, God predicted this. He sent a, he sent a, a prophet, I want to say it was Gad, but I'm not sure now, uh, to go talk to, to Jeroboam. He actually ripped his coat up and gave him 10 pieces and said, this, God's going to give you 10 tribes. If you follow the Lord, your lineage will be established forever. Like, you'll get the blessing that David that, that, that was promised to David, if you follow the Lord, Jeroboam said, okay, but he didn't do it. Rehoboam lost all 10, 10 of the 12 tribes. Only Judah stayed with them because it was his family and Benjamin, but they were a small tribe. Um, but that was uh, Saul, Saul's family, so Saul's fam- uh, tribe. So there was some kind of connection because Jonathan and David were really tight. Um, so, so all the rest of them went to the Jeroboam. Jeroboam set up two golden cows. I don't know what the thing is with golden cows, but they like golden cows. Uh, One in Bethel, which uh, God destroyed, some unknown prophet went and spoke against it, and it just fell apart right in front of everybody. Um, And then another one was up in Dan, um, which was way up in the mountains, and, um, and people had to go way up there to worship instead of just going down to Jerusalem to do the right thing. Uh, And if you're curious, like, hey, why are our... Uh, well, so all those 10 tribes are lost? Well, not completely. There's a remnant. God always saves a remnant. People from each tribe came down to Judah to live with them because they didn't like what Jeroboam was doing with the cows. So they stayed. And if you're curious to why they're called Jews, it's because they're from Judah. That's where the name Jews come from. And so here's a map of Israel and Judah. The top green part is Israel. The purple part is Judah. Um, and, and they fought almost continuously uh, Israel had zero good kings. None of the kings were good. They kept murdering each other to gain power um, and, and, and kept fighting. Where Judah, some of the kings were good. Most of them were evil. Some were just okay. Um, the best kings, I think, probably did nothing um, for a long time. And then God says, hey, you should do something. And they like found the Bible in the temple and then they read it. You know, like that's, that's what made them a good king. And they're like, oh, we should tear down the high places. Let's do that so people could come worship the real God where he, says the, where he says he wants worship instead of worshiping false gods. Yeah, let's do that. 
Um, but they fought each other a lot, um, and then so much so that, that the king of Judah hired Assyria, which is an up-and-coming country to the north, to fight against Israel for them. And Assyria is like, wait, you're going to give us money to go fight somebody we were planning on fighting anyway? Okay, I'll take that. And now that I know that you have money and you're not strong enough to fight these guys, we'll fight you too. And that's exactly what they did. They wiped out Israel. Um, and in 722, they carried them off. You don't need to remember that. Well, it's good to remember that date. 722 uh, is, when, is when northern Israel fell and they put fish hooks in their mouths to drag them off, and they, they spread them out throughout all of Assyria so they would assimilate into the culture, which they did, and that's why they're considered the 10 lost tribes because we lost track of them. Um, the records stopped being kept and all that kind of stuff. Down in Judah, records were still being kept, um, which is good because we needed those records to prove that Jesus is the son of David, uh, was the son of, the son of uh, and going back up to Abraham and then, and then, and then to God. Um, so, so we needed the records in Judah, uh, but, but Assyria took out Israel. And then, oh, here's, here's, here's a picture of Assyria and how vast their, uh, their, their country is. If you notice that little orange circle right there, uh, that's, you know, like 10 pixels wide and 15 pixels high. That's Judah that was not taken over by Assyria. Assyria tried to take over Judah, um, but God intervened. They surrounded Jerusalem. It looked hopeless. They were making fun of God, saying he can't protect you. Guess what? God protected them. He sent one angel down uh, in the middle of the night to take out 185,000 soldiers. And then when they woke up the next morning, they were all dead. And so war was over. Uh, and and so, so that's why they never got taken over, because God was protecting them. He had a different plan for them. Um, if you're wondering, this is where Isaiah was at this time. Isaiah predicted the battle with Assyria, and he lived. He was there. He witnessed. He was there through it. Um, so after after that, in 586 BC, uh, Judah was finally captured by Babylon. Babylon was the next up and coming country after Assyria. Uh, Babylon was mean. They worshipped all sorts of different gods. And everybody in Israel knew that when they were captured by Babylon that they were being punished by God for worshiping other gods. It was not a question in their mind. And that, 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 that brings me to tell you, if God is punishing you for something, and I shouldn't say the word punish in that way, if God is correcting you, if something in your life is hard because of your sin, then God will make it abundantly clear in your heart, you are suffering because you're sinning. Stop sinning, repent, and this will be lifted. God will make that clear to you. There's a lot of suffering in our lives that's not because of our sin. It's because of somebody else's sin. And, and, and there's no releasing yourself from that. If you love somebody and they sin, you suffer for it. And that's just the way it is. Because Christ loved you and you sin. And he suffered for it. And if Christ is not going to escape that suffering, and he could, why would he let you escape that suffering? This suffering because of other people's sins binds you to Christ. It grows your relationship with Christ. So instead of trying to escape the suffering, learn how to love through it. Because while Jesus was dying on the cross, he asked forgiveness for the very men who are killing him. And that's what he calls us to do. Is it impossible? No, it's not impossible. You know how I know? Because Stephen did it. When Stephen was being stoned, he says, don't hold this sin against them. Like, forgive them for what they're doing. And Stephen was a guy like you and me, filled with the Holy Spirit like we are today. He could do it while he was dying. We can do it while we live. So they were taken into captivity into Babylon. Um, here's the route for the captivity, in case you're curious, uh, up from Jerusalem, way up, and then over and then down by the river. You, you wouldn't go straight across because that's all desert. You've got to travel near water. Um, so that's why they went that way. Um, and, then, and then Babylon was this huge kingdom uh, with all sorts of gods. God, God was basically saying, hey, you like foreign gods? Go to Babylon. There's a bunch of them there. 
have your fill. That reminds me of the prodigal son, doesn't it? The dad's saying, all right, here's the money. Go and do what you want. And his son goes and does what he wants and has a great party and then realizes how miserable he is. Finds himself feeding pigs. And if you're a Jewish boy, pigs were not kosher. That was the worst job. That was worse than collecting trash. Was feeding pigs. Then he went crawling back to his father, hoping just to get a job, but was, but, but was welcomed back as a son. The Jews were thrown into this idolatrous kingdom to have their fill, and they realized, no, this is not right. We want to follow the Lord. And when they came back from following the Lord, they were ready. Um, and, and, and after Babylon was Persia, and then the, um, the story of how Babylon fell to Persia is amazing. Uh, you'll read it in Daniel, I want to say it's like chapter 5 or 6. It's when, the, 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 uh, when Balshazar is having this big party and this hand comes out of nowhere and writes on the wall and he poops his pants. You guys remember that one? Um, and, 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 and the way the Persians entered the city and took over was, was amazing. They rerouted an entire river uh, the, the, well, under the walls where the river usually goes to sneak in and, and, and kill the guards. Uh, and then open the doors for the rest of their army to come in and wipe out everybody else. It's amazing um, uh, strategy. And so, so God knew that was happening, gave Daniel the insight to say, hey, you're going to die tonight. This is your judgment um, for, the, for the evil things that you've done. And Persia takes over. Um, and, 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 and when Persia was ruling, there was a king, Cyprus, who, who signed a decree to allow all the Jews who wanted to to go back to Jerusalem, which was exactly prophesied by Daniel uh, 70 years earlier or something like that. And he was called out by name. There's going to be a king. His name is Cyprus, and this is what he's going to decree. And I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know if Cyprus just like, huh, I think I'll let the Jews go back now. They've served their time. Or if he, or if he was, if someone told him the scripture, like maybe even, you know, Daniel or one of the guys says, hey, by the way, God's, God said that you are going to give, give back. And I wonder if he's like, well, if God said it, I better do it. Who knows? I don't know what, how, how that happened, but we know that God said it before this guy was even born. He's born, becomes king, then he does it. And it's amazing. So he sends them back. Uh, this is about 600 BC now. So we're moving through time. Um, Esther takes place during this. Oh, this is the map of Persia, by the way, so you can see how big it is. Um, Susa, that little red dot, that's the capital. That's where the entire book of Esther takes place. Uh, is in Susa. It's in modern-day Iran, if, if you're uh, not sure about the, the, the geography there. Um, so Esther takes place while people are back in Jerusalem. Nehemiah takes place while people are back in Jerusalem. Um, and, and Ezra is a scribe. Nehemiah, remember, is the king's cupbearer, which means he's the, he's the uh, poison tester. You know, he tests the food to make sure it's, it's not poison. And if everyone loves your king, that's an easy job. You get to eat the best stuff. You get to hang out in the palace. Uh, but if, if people don't like your king and they're trying to kill him, that's a very scary job. Um, but, but it seems like as, uh, Nehemiah got along great with this king because when he said, hey, can I go? The king said, yeah, go, and here's some provisions for you. Um, and so they go, and they restore the walls of Jerusalem. They, re they rebuild the temple, although it's not as nice as it once was. Um, and, and, and then there's the 400 years of silence where God does not give any major prophecy. The last one is Malachi, by the way. And the last word of the Old Testament is, 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 is lest you should come and, and, and with a curse or something. The last word is curse uh, in the Old Testament. And, and, and all of the Old Testament, everything that has been written becomes canonized during the 400 years of silence. It all gets collected and gathered and written and copied again and again as one giant book. Um, called the Tanakh, um, and then it gets passed down, and then somewhere during that 400 years, it gets translated into Greek once Alexander the Great takes over. Alexander the Great uh, took over um, the entire world, really. Um, if we look, the, the known world, not what we have now. So I, didn't have a, I couldn't find a colored map, but where the red, lines, the red line goes is, is like the borders of Alexander's greatness. Um, Alexander died a young man, he's like 26, when he died, he drank poison, and, and the controversy isn't how he died, but who killed him. Was it one of his generals, or did he take it himself? Some people think he took the poison himself because there was no one left to fight. He got bored, um, and, and he was a very 
uh, brilliant tactician, um, but he, he didn't really, he couldn't really find another purpose for his life other than fighting. And the reason we, 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 we talk about him and why he's so special is because when he went everywhere, he brought his culture everywhere. And more importantly, he brought his language everywhere. And so the entire known world at that time learned how to speak Greek. They all had their own language, but they also knew Greek. And he named 22 cities Alexandria because he couldn't think of a better name. I defeated this city. I'm going to rebuild it and name it after myself. Goes to the next place. What do you want to call this one? Alexandria. You named the last one Alexandria. I know. It's a good name. Goes to the next one. What do you want to call this one? Alexandria. Again? Yes. Goes to the next one. What do you want to call this one? Let me guess. Alexandria? Absolutely. You know, 22 times he goes around and names them all Alexandria. Um, but he also brings his culture everywhere in the language. And, and, and the, the language of, of ancient Greek is so amazing because it's so specific. We have, we have, we have one word that means many things uh, in, in English, um, and, and other languages have, have the same thing. Like I know in Chinese, the word ma has eight different meanings depending on how you say it, uh, the different tonal inflections. Um, but Greek is very, very, very precise. I mean, they have like, like seven words for love. We would say love, and they, they, they would have seven different words. Four of them are found in the Bible. I don't know what the other three are. Uh, but four of them are found in the Bible. And, and, and they're very specific love, like brotherly love, the phileo, like the love you would have between your brother and, your brother and yourself. Um, or sisterly love, if, if you want to go that way. But it was called brotherly love. There is eros, the, the, uh, the erotic love. That's where uh, the word erotic comes from. And that's like the, the physical feeling of attraction. That's eros. They wouldn't say love. They would say eros. There is uh, sterge, which is a family love, the way you love your parents. The, the, that, that strong bond uh, is sterge. And then, of course, you guys know agape love. Um, we didn't have a word for it in English, so we made one up. It's called charity. Uh, charity comes from a Latin word, which I can't pronounce, uh, that, that actually they made up to mean agape love. Um, and through time, charity got misused uh, enough that it kind of lost its meaning of agape love. So now we just say agape love uh, instead of charity. But that, that's what it was for. Uh, it was for that, that, that self-sacrificial love that God has for us and that he tells us to have for one another, yet we do such a horrible job doing. After Alexander the Great, Rome comes in. And Rome is great, not because um, they treated everybody nice, because they definitely didn't, uh, but what they did, go back, I wasn't ready yet. Uh, because they built roads everywhere. You've heard the, 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 the term, all roads lead to Rome. That was true, because every road they made led back to Rome, because it was for their armies, who was going out from Rome to do battle. They would build roads along the way and then come back. This made it extremely easy for Paul to share the gospel, and for all the disciples to share the gospel. Everywhere they went, everyone could speak Greek. So there wasn't a language barrier. And along the way, they got all these nice Roman roads. No curves. They were straight lines and then sharp 90-degree corners. But, you know, they had these Roman roads, which still exist today. And if you were a Roman citizen like Paul, if anyone attacked you, Rome would, would, would enforce the law. So he was protected. And he didn't even need a passport because everywhere he went was in Rome. It was the best. It was the first best time to share the gospel and God took it. We're getting to that place again, you know, where we could just put something on the internet and everyone reading it, but God didn't want to wait that long. And of course, around 1 BC or some say AD 1, who knows when, when, when it was exact. Actually, there was a guy, I think, who figured it out uh, using the stars. Um, but anyway, uh, so Jesus was born, fulfilling all 300 some odd prophecies about his birth. And he's the only one. No one could, after 70 AD, nobody could fulfill uh, any, those prophecies anymore because the, the, the genealogy got destroyed. The only genealogy that got saved is Jesus's because it was important enough. And people wrote it down for the, gospel, for the gospel of Matthew and, and the gospel of Luke. They recorded his genealogy. Other than that, it's, everything's been lost. And so Jesus was born and he came to save the world. 
He came to save the world from its sin, which was revealed through the law. And we see God's hand in all of it. Through all these 4,000 years, we see God's hand. He's always leading. Up until the point of the death of Jesus, that Jesus gave his life for your sin. He did rise again, in case you were curious, but we're going to start on that next week. But God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son to die on that cross. The sin that the law revealed needed to be paid, and Jesus paid it with his life because of his love for you. And now you have a choice. Are you going to be on the side where you can count on the love of God? Or are you going to try to do everything yourself? And even though you're wrong, you say, I'm going to be right. I'm going to work my way to heaven. And you're going to face God's judgment and wrath. God's got both to offer. He's got love and he's got wrath to give. And he has to give them both because of his heart for love. And he needs to be a just God to give wrath. Your sins need to be paid for. And if you can't pay for them, and you can't, Jesus can, and he did. You get to choose if you give your life to Jesus. Psalm 78, 3 through 4 says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open up my mouth in the parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We know the law, we know the old stories. We will not hide them from our children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. The reason we study history is to see God's love. People say that, that the Old Testament God is, is, is the God of wrath, the New Testament God is the God of love, and no one who says that has ever read the Old Testament. Because we see it through our study tonight that God is a God of love. Keep giving you second chances. Keep redeeming. Yes, you failed. Here's the backup plan. And that was Jesus Christ. First plan was humans don't sin. They sin. Backup plan, Jesus saves you. Are you willing to take that backup plan today?